Hello and welcome wherever you're joining us from. My name is Kevin Featherstone and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, research seminar. The observatory has a regular series of uh, re research seminars. Of course, normally these are held on campus, but with Zoom, uh, we can respond to the uh, restrictions faced by the, uh, the lockdown. Today, we have a presentation on the invisible impact of frozen conflicts, a case study of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus. And it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Nasia Haji Yoyu uh, from uh, the University of Central Lancashire Cyprus uh, campus. Before I introduce uh, the topic and the speaker, let me make one or two organizational uh, points. Uh, we encourage you to send us your questions at any time using the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen, of the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen. Uh, we also invite you to make comments using uh, Twitter, and we suggest a hashtag for today of hashtag LSE Cyprus. Uh, today's seminar is being recorded and we hope to make it available as a podcast uh, later. There'll be plenty of questions, uh, plenty of time for your questions uh, after the presentation. Uh, so we look forward to you uh, sending them. Let me emphasize though, please, please try to keep your questions short. I will have to read them from the screen and it's a lot easier if you go straight to the point. But tell us who you are, any affiliation, and uh, tell us where you're uh, send, sending your questions uh, from, if that's not uh, in London. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome Nasia for uh, her presentation. As I say, she's Assistant Professor in Human Rights and Transitional Justice at the University of Central Lancashire Cyprus campus. <clears throat> she holds an LLB with first class honours from the Un University College in London, an LLM from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD from King's College uh, London. Her recent monograph entitled Protecting Human Rights and Building Peace in Post Violence Societies an underexplored relationship was published by Hart Publishers in 2020, and it focuses on the protection of human rights in Cyprus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as Northern Ireland and South, South Africa. Nasia has uh, received scholarships from various institutions, and she is editor of Identity, Belonging and Human Rights, published by Brill, in 2019. She's currently leading two research projects, one funded by the International Peace Research Association, IPRA, and I'm pleased to say one funded by the LSE's Hellenic Observatory. And it is the project uh, for the Hellenic Observatory that Nasia will be speaking on today. She'll be referring to the living and working conditions of foreign domestic workers in uh, the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, she has conducted a, a survey of those workers to report their experiences, and uh, she'll be examining the constraints, the restrictions, uh, and their particular position in uh, Cyprus uh, and uh, Cypriot society. So we look forward to uh, her empirical findings and discussing what this means, what it tells us about Cyprus, what it tells us about uh, the conflict on Cyprus, what it tells us about feminism uh, in Cyprus. So I'm going to invite Nasia now to speak to us for approximately 30 minutes, and then we should have plenty of time to open up the discussion uh, to your questions and comments. So let me pass to Nasia. Nasia Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Everything's good. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, let me start by sharing my screen.
Can you see my screen? Great. Yes, we can. Okay, so hi everyone again. This presentation is concerned with two seemingly unrelated topics. The treatment of foreign domestic workers on the one hand and the impact of frozen conflicts on the other. Its main argument is that the two are in fact not unconnected, as the perpetuation of the frozen conflict is one of the factors that explains the dire living and working conditions of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus. In particular, I will be arguing that the Cypriot frozen conflict has had three often ignored social consequences. It has deprioritized the feminist agenda. It has normalized nationalist, even racist speech and policies, and it has skewed the public's understanding of human rights. All three have had particularly detrimental effects for foreign domestic workers. First, however, two key terms must be clarified. The, term, the first is foreign domestic workers. These are the workers who are typically responsible for the three C's, cleaning, cooking, and caring of children, the elderly, or disabled persons. They are overwhelmingly women from third, from third countries, so countries outside the European Union, who arrive in Cyprus on a special foreign domestic workers visa that essentially controls all areas of their lives. The second term is frozen conflict. According to Smetana and Ludwig, frozen conflicts, sorry, According to Smetana and Ludwig, frozen conflicts have three characteristics. First, the parties attempted but failed to resolve their incompatibilities through war. Second, after the ceasefire, the core issue over which the war was fought remains a potent instrument of mobilization in domestic politics. And third, the violent re-escalation of the conflict is still a possibility. Having defined the key terms, let's continue by identifying the problem. Foreign domestic workers are vulnerable and marginalized throughout the world. Both the International Labour Organization and the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency report that in practically every country, foreign domestic workers work for more hours and get paid less than the average worker. The reasons for this are well documented in the literature. They have to do with the fact that foreign domestic workers are primarily women. They don't speak the language of the host country. They are migrants. The work they do is essential yet unappreciated. And the conditions in which they work are less than ideal. They often live and work with their employers and they are hidden from the public's eyes which makes it difficult, if not impossible, to prove any allegations of abuse against them or to organize themselves collectively. Now, these challenges exist everywhere, but global challenges notwithstanding, the difficulties faced by foreign domestic workers in Cyprus are particularly acute. The Migrant uh, Integration Policy Index 2020 ranks the Republic of Cyprus 42nd out of the 52 countries that participated in the survey in terms of its integration policies, with a score that is well below that of the European average. Further, the legal framework that regulates foreign domestic workers' rights in Cyprus compares unfavorably with that of other Mediterranean countries like, like Spain. Finally, in 2020, we conducted and the Hellenic Observatory generously funded a survey of 150 foreign domestic workers. I had suspected that things were bad, but the survey results were eye-opening. If we take just the simplest statistic, participants reported that they are working 40, that is 40, 40% more hours than what their contract provides. I want to break this number down so that you understand the severity of the situation. Foreign domestic workers are contractually obligated to work for 42 hours per week. Of the 150 women we spoke to, only two 
said that they work for 42 hours per week. 36 women, in other words, more than one in five work more than 70 hours per week. This is close to, or in some cases, more than twice what they are contractually obligated to work. A third are not always paid or are not always paid the full amount they are owed. And to a different question, again, a third reported that they are not always paid on time. Even though the contract provides that foreign domestic workers are to clean only one house, 67%, two in three, clean two houses or more, sorry, clean two houses or more with some cleaning up to four houses. And although the contract stipulates that foreign domestic workers have to take a day off per week, one in three participants reported working every single day, day in, day out for years. And we think that being in lockdown for a few weeks is bad. The numbers are clear. We are not just talking about a few employers who are bad apples. The problem is a systemic one. The legal framework that regulates the working conditions of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus has been criticized in the strongest language by an array of international organizations. It has also been condemned by the Ombudsman of the Republic itself in 2010, in 2013, in 2019, and in 2020. The basic explanation for this is that foreign domestic workers are essentially not considered worthy of attention or protection by the state. One example of this concerns the government's reaction following the 2019 serial killer case. For those of you who are not familiar with the case, between 2016 and 2018, a man killed five women and two of their daughters, all of them migrants, most of them foreign domestic workers. In 2019, the first of the bodies was accidentally found. These raised questions why the police had not started looking for these women earlier. It became clear that the police had not even investigated reports of these women's disappearances because they had assumed that they had run off to the areas that are not under the control of the Republic. With this background in mind, the president of the country attempted to respond to the public outcry by declaring that he would establish, in his words, a special department within the Ombudsman office which would investigate every complaint relating to foreign domestic workers living conditions in Cyprus. The president seems to, be, seems to have been entirely unaware of the fact that the Ombudsman already has this exact mandate and that after each investigation, a report is sent to the Council of Ministers, which he presides over for further reflection and discussion. A second example of the lack of care that the Republic has exhibited towards foreign domestic workers is the following. In order for a foreign domestic worker to be employed and therefore legally reside in Cyprus, she must sign a standard employment contract, that of the 42 hours I mentioned before. This was drafted back in 1991 by the Migration Department, note, not by the Ministry of Labor, and remained unamended until, from 1991, until 2019. In particular, it was amended immediately after the serial, the serial killer case made headlines, and one could be excused for taking the cynical view that it would not have been amended had it not been for the serial killer case. Now, the new employment contract is an improvement to the old one. It, it, it hardly could have been <laughs> more problematic. Anyway, the, the, the new employment contract is an improvement to the old one, but it is still disappointing. For example, it creates an obligation on employers to keep a record of the employee's working hours, yet, it does not explain what the employer is to do with these records, who the employer should disclose them to and why. In fact, 
Upon further inspection, no government department appears to have the mandate to collect, let alone act upon, such information. So the question remains, what are the factors that make foreign domestic workers so invisible in the eyes of the, of the Cypriot state? The first factor is that in Cyprus, the national issue has taken priority over feminist demands for greater empowerment. This affects foreign domestic workers in particular because most of them are women. The relative marginalization of women in the country is reflected in the fact that Cyprus ranks 21st out of the 27 EU member states in the Gender Equality Index, scoring just 57 out of 100 points. This is 11 points lower than the European average. This is especially so in the domain of power in which Cyprus has scored less than 30 percentage points and was ranked 24th. Even women who are in power do not seem to be that bothered about the empowerment of other women and have tended to focus their efforts on addressing issues that relate to the frozen conflict. As one feminist put it in 2019, the political attitude seems to be very much along the lines of let's sort out the Greek Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot thing first, and then we will sort out the gender thing. This was perhaps most aptly illustrated in a UN-supported event intended to empower the women of Cyprus. After a long list of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriot women were given the floor, the co-founder of Obreras Empowered, an association that promotes the rights of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus, was given the opportunity to speak. This was the moment many feminists decided to leave the room as the topic of discussion stopped being one they were interested in. Hence, the frozen conflict has undercut feminist efforts in three interrelated ways. First, it has deprioritized women's, women's issues as a whole. It has, second, it has empowered only a subcategory of women who come from a specific socio-political and ideological background. And finally, these women have tended to overlook those whose identity and interests are not aligned with the national narrative they have adopted. The implications of the deprioritization of the feminist agenda for foreign domestic workers are profound. For instance, the employment contract refers to the possibility of launching a complaint against one's employer, but that is all it says. It includes no reference, for example, to who investigates the complaint, how long the procedure will take, what are its possible outcomes, and what are the rights of each party during the process. When one digs a bit deeper, it transpires that as long as the complaint is being investigated, a process that can take several months, the foreign domestic worker is not allowed to work and she's also not eligible for receiving any state support. This lacuna in the law has a disproportionate impact on women who are much more likely to be victims of violence than men. It leaves foreign domestic workers with only unsatisfactory options. So a foreign domestic worker can report, but stay without any income for months, thus forcing her to turn to survival sex. She can stay with her abusive employer, or she can leave her employment and become an irregular migrant, which is going to afford her even less protection by the law. When one considers these options, it is unsurprising that 75%, three in four, state that they would not inform the authorities if they had been victims of physical or sexual abuse. Now, despite the shock factor of this statistic, it is totally absent from any discussion about violence against women or violence against migrants in Cyprus. Let me give you another example of the effects of deprioritizing the feminist agenda. Foreign domestic workers are paying social insurance, contribu social insurance contributions that theoretically make them eligible for free medical services, including a biannual PAP test. 
when the 150 foreign domestic workers were asked whether they regularly have a pap test, 32% replied that they do not, and a further 46% of participants answered that they do not know what a pap test is. In focus groups that followed, not a single person was aware of the fact that foreign domestic workers, like all other female workers in Cyprus, were entitled to this service for free. So while foreign domestic workers are in principle eligible to benefit from the general health care scheme, to which they are contributing, they are total disregard from the state and its failure to provide information about this right has rendered it illusory. The second factor that exacerbates the poor treatment of foreign domestic workers is the normalization of nationalist and even racist speech and policies in the country. Frozen conflict can only be sustained if a series of societal beliefs are accepted by the general population. These beliefs include the in-group's victimization, we are the victims, a positive self-image, we are right, the need for unity, don't disagree with our leaders, those who criticize the government are unpatriotic, and then delegitimization of the outgroup. Out group. They are unreasonable, they are out to get us, and so on and so forth. Combined, these beliefs create fertile ground for a sense of nationalism or even for a sense of racism camouflaged as nationalism. And while in the Republic, those that suffer the most from this nationalism or racism are Turks and Turkish Cypriots, the wide acceptance and normalization of this language by the general population has implications for other groups as well. If someone is perceived as sharing characteristics with the out group, even if she's not a member of that out group, she is considered an outsider. Similarly, if she has characteristics that are different to those of the in-group and the out-group, she is again unwelcome because in zero-sum identity conflicts, whoever is not with us is necessarily against us. In the words of the first attorney general of the Republic of Cyprus, Cypriot nationals who do not identify as Greek or Turkish and therefore do not have a community to protect them are second-class citizens extrapolating the status of foreign domestic workers, non-citizens who do the work that first-class citizens refuse to, is even lower. The treatment of third country nationals, or at least poor third country nationals, by the Cypriot government as a whole, is encapsulated in the words of a 10-year-old boy quoted by Spiro. The Turks, he says, being uncivilized as they are, have a mentality that is different. It would not bother them at all to kill, to loot a country. In general, their mentality is very Asian. Let me pause here and say that Asians, and in particular Filipinos, Sri Lankans, Nepalese, Indians, and Vietnamese, make up 98% of foreign domestic workers in the country. This merging of Turks and Asians in a single threatening unit has not happened accidentally in the Republic. Rather, it is the result of grouping Turks and migrants, and sometimes even asylum seekers, and treating them as a threatening whole. Just one example of this is the Minister of Interior referring to migrants and asylum seekers in 2019 and stating that, in his words, there is a danger that in Cyprus, by Cyprus he meant the areas under the control of the Republic. So there is a danger that in Cyprus, a Muslim minority will be created. And then continuing ominously, there are settlers in the free areas. One explanation for this is that under the Anand plan, the number of Turkish, sorry, the number of Turkish settlers who would become naturalized and allowed to remain in Cyprus was 45,000. This is the same as the number of third country nationals that currently reside in the Republic of Cyprus. Although this was never explicitly stated, people who participated in the Anand plan negotiations hinted that the two numbers are related. 
the more third country nationals were allowed in the one, the more Turkish settlers would be allowed in the other. Concerns that the high number of foreign domestic workers would have a detrimental impact on its negotiating power have arguably shaped the government's decision to classify these people as temporary workers. Describing policies that are still in place today, the Ministry of Labour explained in, 20, in 2007 that the introduction of foreign domestic workers in the 1990s was only acceptable as a temporary measure um, in, li in limited numbers and occupations where their immediate cover by Cypriots, meaning Greek Cypriots, was not possible. However, labeling foreign domestic workers as temporary allows the government to afford substandard rights protection to them. Let me illustrate this with a practical example. Under EU law, third country nationals who have been working in an EU member state for five years or more are eligible to apply for permanent residency. A foreign domestic worker can be issued a visa for a maximum of six years, thus complying with the EU directive. Yet, when an eligible foreign domestic worker applied for permanent residency, she was denied this because she had been told from the outset that she was a temporary worker. This ineligibility for permanent residency, however, means that foreign domestic workers can never hope to be employed in a different sector, will always be precarious migrant workers, and crucially, for a group of women, 79% of whom are mothers, will always and automatically be disqualified from family reunification. Further, because they are considered temporary, foreign domestic workers are excluded from the Republic's obligations to ensure that migrant workers are integrated in Cypriot society. So, two implications of the frozen conflict we have discussed so far. It has deprioritized the feminist agenda and it has normalized nationalist speech and policies. The third implication is that it has skewed Greek Cypriots understanding of human rights. In an attempt to attract international support, which is expected to translate in additional negotiating power when negotiating the future peace settlement, Greek Cypriots have been presenting themselves both domestically and internationally exclusively as the victims of human rights violations that took place in 1974. There is no mention in public discussions of other groups who suffered from these violations. And there is also no mention of human rights violations committed by Greek Cypriots themselves. This emphasis on Greek Cypriot victimhood has had two implications. First, it has encouraged the belief that since Greek Cypriots suffered such gross human rights violations in their past, they are in a special category in which they deserve greater protection from the state. Others might also be victims of human rights violations, but their experiences are less horrific than those suffered by the Greek Cypriot community as a whole. Contrast, for instance, the treatment of Greek Cypriot displaced persons and asylum seekers from third countries like Syria. This was most clearly reflected in a 2020 statement by the Minister of Interior, just before declaring policies that would restrict the rights of asylum seekers. Mr. Nouris stated that Cypriots, meaning Greek Cypriots, Cypriots experienced war and refugeehood in 1974 and know firsthand what it means to be a real refugee. The second implication of this emphasis on Greek Cypriot victimhood is that human rights have mostly been viewed as something that is exclusively given or taken by others. There is little appreciation that the protection of human rights must be the product of local initiatives and public pressures rather than benevolent motherlands and superpowers. As a result, there is virtually no or very little mobilization pushing for the protection of the rights of the vulnerable. 
the impact of this skewed perception of human rights becomes most obvious when one focuses on human rights education in schools. For decades after the war, the school curriculum was developed to teach, in Cariolemus's words, loyalty to the Hellenic world, the Greek language, and orthodoxy. Theoretically, since 2010, the school curriculum has been revised and become less nationalist than before by focusing on ideals such as human dignity, equality, and democracy. In practice, however, no training has been offered at all to the teachers to make this transition a successful one. So when primary school teachers were asked in 2016 to mention human rights violations in the country, all of them used 1974 as their starting point. Even today, the curriculum does not include any references to the rights of foreign domestic workers or even to migrants and asylum seekers more generally. This emphasis on the Greek Cypriots being the victims that must be protected by the threatening foreigners is reflected in the views of the students themselves. So to give you just one example, a student who was interviewed by Zambilas and Lesta in 2011 had this to say, I am a racist, I admit it. I just want migrants out of my country. I don't see anything wrong with that. If we want our country to remain Greek, migrants and Turks should leave. I believe I have the right to be racist when half of my country is occupied and the other half is about to lose its Greekness. Note how this idea of being under threat by Turks and being under threat by migrants is encapsulated in a single sentence. Note also how comfortable this 16 year old is in expressing these views. And it means that no one has signaled to him that there is something wrong with expressing these things. Perhaps the starkest illustration of how our educational system views foreign domestic workers is the decision in 2015 of one school, and allegedly there were more, to include as a gift in its Christmas raffle the payment of expenses to bring foreign domestic, a foreign domestic worker to Cyprus. Ironically, this incident took place during the year in which the Ministry of Education set aware awareness raising of students against racism and intolerance as its priority learning aim. Even after the Ombudsman's intervention, the school showed no appreciation that the gift did not meet educational objectives or that it normalized perceptions of foreign domestic workers as not deserving full re respect. So to conclude, the frozen conflict creates, to quote Olga Dimitriou, minor losses. It might, it might be nonviolent, but it is certainly not cost-free, especially for those in the society that are not members of the dominant group and for those who do not neatly fall in one of the categories created and perpetuated by the frozen conflict itself. Foreign domestic workers might be vulnerable everywhere, but the frozen conflict in Cyprus exacerbates their vulnerability because of the societal dynamics it gives rise to. What remains to be seen is whether this phenomenon affects other vulnerable groups in Cyprus, for example, the LGBTQI plus prisoners, etc., and whether it also exists in other fr frozen conflict societies as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nasia, very much indeed. That's uh, uh, very, very clear and very uh, stark, and it's uh, clearly some uh, very important uh, research that you have done, and I'm very pleased that the LSE's Hellenic Observatory has facilitated uh, this important uh, project. Um, of course, the the subject matter is very concerning and uh, you make uh, some very um, worrying uh, points or uh, points that cause us to stop and reflect. I'm going to invite our audience to send me their questions using the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen. 
But before we go to the Q&A, I wonder, Nancy, if I could just ask you a few questions of my own. I wonder, uh, you've given us the, uh, the roots, as it were, of why foreign, foreign domestic workers in Cyprus uh, have these conditions. But I wonder if you could um, bring it to the foreground a little more and just tell us uh, why the plight of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus is not part of the more uh, everyday political agenda and why there isn't more political support being expressed in, uh, the, in, in public uh, to do something about the uh, plight and the vulnerabilities of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, the, the, the Ombudsman back in her 2013 report had this to say about this. Um, she said, the, the violations of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus have been normalized to such an extent that people do not even perceive them as being violations. Yes, they, they perceive them as, as being the normal state of affairs. So on the one hand, the, there is no push from the grassroots to do something about this because there is very little appreciation that what foreign domestic workers are experiencing is problematic. To the contrary, many people feel that, you know, they, they, they are lazy. They're just sitting with an old person day in, day out doing nothing and they have demands on top of, on top of everything else. Um, so the, the grassroots element is, is missing. On the other hand, from the top down, um, that is also missing. First of all, because the, the, the government has totally failed to ratify key legal instruments that would have afforded some legal protections to foreign domestic workers. And also because there are no incentives for politicians or even for civil society, frankly, to deal with this matter because in a nutshell, the frozen conflict is completely crowding out mm. all of these considerations. I can understand the deeper aspects, but for example, in the Ombudsman's office, which the president has long given the power to, quote, do something about it, to report to the presidents on uh, problems like this. Successive Ombudsman have not actually given voice to this issue at all, as I understand it. I, I don't think that's very fair. I think they oh. have, hence the number of reports that have been published on this. So uh -huh. over the last 10 years, there are four. I, I don't think there is really any other issue that the, that the Ombudsman has written so much about over such a long period of time. And in addition to these systems, Demic reports, they are dealing with individual complaints and they are publishing reports with regards to those individual com complaints, but they are falling on deaf ears. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, the only time we have had uh, any sort of reaction from society or from politicians about these women's rights has been following the serial killer fiasco uh, investigations. And I think it's because it, it struck really close to home. You know, it could have been my domestic worker. <laughs> I don't think there has been anything, a, a, anything else that, that can compare to, okay. yes. Okay. Um, you're in Lefkowitz here and I'm in the UK uh, here. Let me ask a question uh, from a distance in every sense. Uh, you're suggesting the central part of your argument is that uh, this neglect, this abuse comes from the frozen conflict. And I, and I wonder if we were to um, 
examine the major force, the major reasons uh, for this problem. Is it the fro is it the frozen conflict, or is it that uh, Cyprus, in any event, is a socially conservative society, and uh, it is those that conservatism that leads to the problem, rather than or equally equal to uh, the frozen conflict. Okay, so uh, let me first clarify that I. I don't think that, this, that the frozen conflict is the reason that for, foreign domestic workers are facing the dire living and working conditions they're facing. I think it's one of the factors that exacerbates um, things. Having said that, I think you're absolutely right that Cyprus is a socially conservative society. But I think we're ultimately saying the same thing because Cyprus is a socially conservative society, at least partly because of the frozen conflict. Uh -huh. Because okay. it has not allowed people to start thinking about other things. You know, every time, even, you know, we, we a few months ago, we had debates in, in parliament about the budget, you know, and you have MPs in parliament supposed to be discussing the budget and they are talking about what happened in 1974. Why? Because that's what they know. And that's what they repeat. And this plays out in every debate in the country, whether mm. it has to do with gay rights, whether it has to do with prisoner rights, whether it has to do with foreign domestic workers' rights, which is the reason that I am hypothesizing in a future paper, maybe, that this is not exclusive to foreign domestic workers. These socially conservative um, society or socially conservative tendencies you have accurately identified are linked to the frozen conflict and are impacting other groups of vulnerable people. Okay, thanks. Perhaps the, the last point from me then, um, you've, mentioned to the, you've mentioned other cases where this uh, social conservatism may have impact, LGBT, LGBT uh, rights, uh, etc. I wonder, clearly your presentation here is, is based on uh, extensive primary field uh, research, but for those of us joining you from, uh, from a distance, uh, I wonder if you could just make a little bit more comment about uh, whether you think the frozen conflicts, the social conservatism uh, is impacting or how it impacts in other cases beyond foreign direct, uh, foreign domestic workers. Uh, uh, tell us how you think, how you might hypothesize that it impacts on uh, um, wider social issues. Um, so there is a PhD thesis from Dr. Kamenu, it's a few years old, that has, I think, a, a title that really sums up the, the answer perfectly. It has to do with gay rights, that, that PhD thesis. And, and, it, and it's called Cyprus is the land of heroes, not homosexuals. So, um, you know, it's a horrible quote, but I think it brings home this idea that um, nationalism in, in its nasty form, because nationalism also has a, a, a valuable form, right? I mean, I, I, I might be nationalist in the sense that I, I am proud of my country. That's not the nationalism I'm talking about here. I'm talking about nationalism in the sense that I think I'm better than, than people of other nationalities. And um, nationalism and racism and um, exclusive language that are feeding the frozen conflict and are also empowered by the, fed by the frozen conflict. So they create a vicious cycle. They create expectations about how Cypriots are supposed to be behaving. Yes, a, a true Cypriot is a Cypriot that is, is, is really manly, okay? And in the socially conservative 
society in which we live, that necessarily excludes a true Cypriot from being gay. I mean, I, it's, it's absurd. I'm trying to explain it, trying to put it into words. It just like, shows how problematic this is, but it is the reality that many young people are facing here. That frozen conflict creates boxes and it creates expectations. And if you don't fall in a box and if you don't meet the expectation, then you're doing something wrong and you're punished by society. Not only because you are an individual failure, but because you are not benefiting society's struggle. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, so we have a number of questions. I'm just going to uh, take these questions um, as they come and ask you to give um, your response fairly brief uh, to each uh, question, please. Um, with the format here of the Q&A, it's very difficult for me to give the questions any kind of logical order or uh, coherence. So uh, it may be that we, we touch on issues from different aspects, uh, but we have some good questions uh, coming in, in here. The first is from Anastasia Leopatriti. Uh, hello from Nicosia. Um, uh, she is a senior EU project manager at the Center for Social Innovation. And she asks, how can the organizations that work with EU funded projects contribute to a systematic change in how migrant women in Cyprus are perceived and treated, apart from training and education that we already offer? So in other words, one lever for reform, for action, would be uh, via the European Union, um, requiring those in receipt of EU funds uh, to take ameliorative actions in some, in some way. Do you think there is potential there? Yes, I think there is. I think it might be the only way out. Um, so definitely training and education is a key one. But Anastasia already mentioned it. Um, I, just, just to, I, I mean, some some of the statistics that I didn't have time to discuss in my presentation show that the single greatest obstacle to foreign domestic workers claiming their rights is that they are unaware of them. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, training and education is definitely important. In addition to that, you have lobbying. And I mean, to a certain extent, that has started taking place, but because it's very isolated and it, it, lobbying for the protection of foreign domestic workers' rights happens from one or two organizations in Cyprus only, it's very easy to ignore. And the other thing that um, organizations with EU funding can do is actually take this to the courts because I think there are several legal issues with how they're being treated. One example is what you have already referred to, the idea that they, that they are not eligible for permanent, um, for permanent residency in Cyprus. This is a decision of the Supreme Court from 2008. And I am quite confident that if this went to the court today, the court would have reached a different decision. It is standing on very shaky legal ground. It was already a majority decision then. The European Court of, of Justice, so the, the Court of Justice of the European Union has already made it clear that it's not terribly happy with the decision. So I think the factors are there to introduce change. You need money and you need a willing foreign domestic worker to put herself forward as the guinea pig. Okay, good, thank you. Next question from Bernard Casey, a former colleague uh, here at the Hellenic Observatory. He's a frequent visitor to Cyprus and uh, also a consultant to governments in Nicosia. He asks, to what extent are foreign domestic workers not even registered under law precisely because they come in from outside and over a porous border? How many of your survey sample fell into that category? Okay, so that's a really good question. Uh, the, um, the Republic of Cyprus, 
according to statistics from July 2019, says that there are 18 and a, th and, and a half thousand registered foreign domestic workers and the ombudsman estimates that there are about as many irregular foreign domestic workers in Cyprus. So making a total of roughly... So making a total of about 35,000. Um, yeah. Having said that, the legal framework that I have described, the problematic employment contract, the, uh, the, the fact that they are not, uh, not eligible for uh, permanent residency, the fact that they are not eligible for family reunification, the fact that there is zero checks on what the employers are doing with them after they have brought them to Cyprus, the fact that they are not allowed to change their employer after they get to Cyprus, imagine being bound to stay with LSE forever, <laughs> even, if, even if you didn't like it there. Uh, these things are characteristics of the legal framework that relates only to the legally registered foreign domestic workers. So yes, there are many irregular foreign domestic workers, but it's not because of that, or I don't think it's mainly because of that, that we are seeing what we are seeing. It's, it's the framework that has a problem. Thank you, yes. And you uh, were also talking to some of the irregular workers? So that is a question we decided not to ask because we were oh, worried yes. that they would not answer it truthfully and it would defeat the purpose of the of the okay. empirical research thanks as this seminar is being recorded let me just make it clear that i am perfectly happy to be uh, condemned to work at the lse for the rest of my life <laughs> uh next question from uh constantine uh Buhaya. uh i am re-researching my postponed publication of a book on Cyprus to take into account the impact of the pandemic factor. My question, there are different communities living now in Cyprus, British, Russian, Gulf states, Israeli, Chinese, and so on. Is the reported exploitation of foreign domestic workers confined to native Cypriot employers, or is it noticeable in, households, in the households mentioned above? Also, do domestic workers communicate, communicate, communicate <laughs> what a word to um, stumble over, do domestic workers communicate in Greek or in the Greek Cypriot, is his question. I'm, I'm not sure I understood the second question. No, I'm not sure that I do, but I'm just reading literally. Do the domestic workers communicate in Greek or in the Greek Cypriot? dialect yeah. she meant maybe um so yeah. let me answer the the first question um are the conditions that i described exclusive to cypriot or do they relate to um to are they a product of of non-cypriots as well the, the short answer is i don't know um I, I, I don't have, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't guess. I, I have a hunch that Cypriots, or to put it differently, that non-Cypriots might be treating their employees slightly better, but that's a hunch and it's not substantiated. So I'll leave it at, I don't know. Yeah, did, in your survey, did you ask about the nationality of their, their employer? No, maybe we should have. No, maybe we should have. Yes, okay. it would have been useful. Yes, I mean, your hypothesis about being better, uh, equally, you might uh, put the hypothesis the reverse, that those without a social route in Cyprus may feel uh, less, less, less um, restricted somehow to uh, in their treatment of their own domestic workers let me explain why i hypothesized that it wasn't please, please, yes it, it didn't come out of anywhere it's it's because uh -huh. one of the one of the deliverables of the lse funded project the Hellenic observatory funded projects that that you mentioned before was a report that i co-authored with the ombudsman of the republic 
And that received a lot of publicity by Cypriot newspapers. So when that was published, I actually heard from a lot of people, a lot of people emailed saying, we liked it, we didn't like it. And from that, uh, from that response of people who contacted me and identified themselves and, and expressed an opinion on the findings, I tended to find that non-Cypriots this is a generalization, of course, where more willing to accept that there was a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question from Petrus uh, Katsarias, uh, who is a senior lecturer in linguistics from the University of Westminster. Um, There are several questions, so uh, perhaps I could just uh, focus. Um, could you say a little bit more about the migration trajectories of foreign domestic workers and their legal status in Cyprus? How do they get to migrate to Cyprus for work? Um, yeah, so there are Foreign domestic workers get to Cyprus through what we call agents. These are private individuals who have connections in Cyprus and connections in their respective country of the foreign domestic workers. So the five countries that I already mentioned, these are uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the Philippines, Nepal. Um, okay, there are two more which I'm missing. And basically the the, the, the agent brings them to Cyprus for a specific family. So he, the, the idea is that the agent knows that there is a family that is looking for a domestic worker and he finds someone who would meet the profile and brings them to Cyprus. And, and it, all, it all happens like this. It, there is no government involvement. And if uh, Nasia were you were to hypothetically be made minister uh, tomorrow in charge of the this issue, would you feel that action, public policy action via, via the agencies, could be more effective than action in relation to the uh, particular individual households? I think it would be a useful addition, add-on. Yes, it, it cannot be the only thing that the government does. I mean, the government has already started um, focusing in that direction um, by, for example, um, checking to see whether the agents are giving accurate information to the foreign domestic workers they are bringing to Cyprus. Um, and many were, weren't. So just in 2019, um, something like 20 private agencies were shut down by the government for not complying with um, with basic regulations. I mean, 20 might sound like a small number in the UK, but in Cyprus, I mean, that's massive. Um, so definitely there is room for improvement there. Uh, but as I said, it wouldn't be the only thing okay. that has to change. Thank you. So a question from uh, Marius Cantares, who is uh, health at the Health Services Research Centre. Uh, we've done research on the access and barriers to health services by foreign domestic workers in Cyprus. We have found that the role of the employer is crucial and that of dependency on almost everything, mostly of the employers. Most of the employers are women and they are Cypriot women are crucial to their social integration. I'm sorry, the question's a little uh, unclear. I'm going to start again. Uh, so Marius has done research on the access and barriers to health services for foreign domestic workers in Cyprus. And they found that the role of the employer is crucial, uh, involving a dependency on them for almost everything. Most of the employers are women and they are Cypriot women, and they are crucial to their social integration. The trade unions are also very powerful in Cyprus. Why don't they take up this group of workers as members? 
Okay, so these are two, I, I, I think one is a comment and the other is a question really. Um, yes, I agree that uh, the role of the employer is crucial, especially in relation to, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find some statistics that, I, I, that are relevant to this. Um, it's fine. Uh, the, the role of the employer is crucial, especially in terms of accessing healthcare. Um, something like half of the women we asked reported that they only go to the doctor when they, when, when they are sick, if their employer books an appointment for them. These are grown up women uh, who only have access to a GP if their employer deems that their illness is serious enough for them to, to see the, the GP. Otherwise, the employer will simply decide that uh, he or she will go to the pharmacy and, and pick something up. So I agree with the comment that access to healthcare in particular is very closely connected to the employer. Um, the second question concerned the trade unions. Let me say that until 2019, so with the old employment contract, the one that existed between 1991 and 2019, it was under the contract illegal for foreign domestic workers to join a trade union, which is unconstitutional because under the Cypriot constitution, everyone, every worker has access to um, to a trade union is able to join or form a trade union. This changed in, in 2019. We asked the question, now that you have access to this right, are you willing to, to use it? In the anonymous questionnaires, many said that they would. When we were discussing it in the, in, in, in the focus groups, however, Many change their minds and we think it's because they are worried that if they join a trade union, they will be perceived as troublemakers. So definitely trade unions lobbied to not have foreign domestic workers as their members because the understanding was that these women will come and get Cypriot's jobs. Um, now that's no longer the case. They have access to trade unions, but there has been zero attempts from the trade unions to attract foreign domestic workers. That's very interesting. Uh, Fazil Ozum, uh, a PhD student from your university, uh, would like to ask if you have en encountered any indicators of human trafficking during your research, such as debt bondage, or confiscation of legal documents? Yes. And if so, what is the percentage of this? So it's, it's pretty common, not just in Cyprus, in the whole of Europe, for the employer to confiscate the passport as a way of making sure that the uh, foreign domestic worker doesn't leave the house. We didn't, we didn't ask this question, but so I don't have a percentage. Uh, but I know that it's happening and, and it has happened among the 150 women we have spoken to. Thank you. Uh, we're going back to the EU dimension. There's a question from a G. Leslie. Why are gross violations of human rights of foreign domestic workers ignored by the European Union? Can't the European Union force Cyprus to give residency to these workers? Are no members of the European Parliament hor horrified? Surely it constitutes a breach of treaty obligations, as well as breaching the European human rights standards, which the Council of Europe should be protesting about. Has no domestic or foreign NGO tried to take cases to the European Court of Human Rights? Okay, so that question started off by asking about the European Union and then and then moved to the Council of Europe. So both. Um, the the answer with regards to the European Union is it, yes, the European Union could have done something and it hasn't. Um, so 
one might think, I mean, because of the, as I said, foreign domestic workers are, are vulnerable everywhere. That includes other European states. That shows a lack of care by other European states. This is not exclusive to, to the Cypriot government. It, it might be exacerbated in Cyprus, but it's, it's, it, it happens everywhere. So if European states are not particularly concerned with protecting foreign domestic workers in their own territories, I don't see why they would make any fuss about Cyprus not doing the same. So that's the European Union angle. The Council of Europe angle and the, um, and the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights, there have not been any cases that have to do with uh, foreign domestic workers in, in Cyprus. Back in 2004, there was a really well-known case that had to do with artista visas. These, these were visas of women who were brought to Cyprus to work in, in cabarets. And that visa was also problematic. And it changed because of Ranchev and Cyprus of that ECHR case. Academics have hypothesized that the only way this can change is through another Ranchev, is through another woman dying and their family taking the case to the ECHR. I hope it doesn't come to that. We haven't seen anything like this yet. Thank you. Um, there are lots of questions, I'm afraid. Um, I, uh, perhaps directly in relation to what you've just said, uh, Nasio, then um, there's a question here from Lisbon, Eve Petrakidou. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, given that there's this growing awareness, what do you think is the missing piece for creating enough disruption to change these patterns? And I would, would add to what uh, Eve is saying that you've just hypothesized that one of the most effective ways of correcting the abuse and the um, vulnerability of foreign domestic workers in Cyprus would be for an NGO to go to the European Court of Human Rights. But they haven't. It's a dog that didn't bark, uh, if uh, that's an appropriate metaphor, but something, something obvious hasn't happened. And uh, Eve is asking, uh, what do you think ultimately would be the most effective ways to change the, uh, this situation? For the dog to wake up. Um, okay, so from a legal perspective, in order for someone to apply to the ECHR, they have to be a victim. Yes, you cannot, an NGO cannot unilaterally take a case to the ECHR arguing there are human rights violations in Cyprus. They need to find a foreign domestic worker that is willing to come forward, that is willing to report, exhaust domestic remedies. So start in the district court, go to the Supreme Court and finally find her way to the ECHR. And then they, they, the, the case must be strong enough in terms of the evidence that is uh, provided, and then it will eventually reach the ECHR. There are, practically speaking, many problems here. The first one being that by the time domestic remedies are exhausted, a decade has passed mm. because the legal system in Cyprus is so slow. If a woman has a visa for six years, she will be back in Sri Lanka by the time the, the, the case is heard. So practically speaking, there are zero incentives for someone to come forward. In addition, the Ombudsman has noted back in 2010 that every time allegations against employers are made, somehow the employers respond by saying that this foreign domestic worker has committed theft or has done something else. Now, instead of the, of the appropriate authorities treating the two complaints separately. In other words, a foreign domestic worker has made this complaint, let's deal with it. The employer has made that complaint, let's deal with it. What happens is the employer's complaint takes precedent and she's deported. So it's 
practically very difficult to find the recipe and the conditions in place to reach the ECHR. And it is for this reason that the dog has embarked, I think. Now, what needs to change? Frankly, I thought that the serial killer case would change things and it hasn't. So, you know, five women and two five-year-olds died and nothing changed. Okay, we're back to the European Union uh, and a uh, question I presume directly from Brussels, from Angelique Petritis, who is in the European Commission Director General for Home Affairs, Legal Pathways and Integration. And she makes the, the point that Cyprus, like other EU member states at this very moment, is preparing a national integration strategy with funds of the European Union to be presented in 2022. Do you think that this strategy could bring a change to the conditions of foreign domestic workers? Well, if it's anything like the previous one, no. <laughs> and the reason for that is because the previous one expressly excluded employers who are households from obligations for integration, mm -hmm. which meant that it expressly left foreign domestic workers entirely out of the integration strategy because the only employer that a foreign domestic worker will have is a household. Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything changing in that direction. It, it might be that Cyprus has decided to revise its strategy. The previous one did not protect foreign domestic workers at all. And Joya Lahoud, uh, from the a law student from Cyprus, asks, uh, when did Cyprus last change its national teaching curriculum curricula in school? And how can the European Union push Cyprus to improve the situation? Because you were talking about uh, the references to human rights in the school curriculum at the moment that each of the teachers that you had um, reported began the lesson by referring to uh, the, uh, the 1974 uh, Cyprus uh, conflict. And I guess Yoya is saying, um, well, it's it specifically when did Cyprus last change its uh, teaching curricula in schools? 2010. 2010. 2010. Uh, and do you think the Europe changing the that school curricula uh, is something of a, a background factor or, or could this be a powerful shift? Well, things changed in 2010 on paper. I don't think respect? they changed in, in, in the sense that uh, the curriculum was explicitly more nationalist before 2010. There was a lot more emphasis on the Greek Cypriot victims, etc. While after 2010, there are um, there are values incorporated in in the curriculum like human dignity. And if you have a, a teacher that you know takes an interest in human rights that teacher could, I think, take values such as human dignity and introduce debates about the rights of foreign domestic workers. But there has been no training for teachers to become more sensitive to human rights issues. And there has been nothing in the curriculum that explicitly requires teachers to refer to foreign domestic workers or migrants or asylum seekers. So, you know, yes, the veneer has changed. It's up to the teacher whether anything changes to a greater extent. Okay, thank you. Um, question from G. Leslie. Uh, I think this is the second question. Um, how many foreign domestic workers suffer physical abuse and how many sex abuse? And do you have any idea, in addition, of the total number who are not paid at all, or not the right amount, or not on time? I think you gave data on the on on that. 
I did, yes. So a third of the respondents are either not getting paid at all or not the full amount. And to a different question, again, so it, it could be the same third or it could be different. Um, and 33% again said that they're not getting paid on time. Um, so that's with regards to uh, remuneration. With regards to sexual and physical abuse, we decided to not ask the question because we thought it was too um, uh, sensitive, but we did have women who volunteered the information. And so from focus groups that, that had 20 individuals to declared sexual abuse by their employer or someone in the family. So that's, I mean, it's hardly a, a big enough sample, but of the women we spoke to, 10%. They, they volunteered that. They volunteered that information. Mm -hmm. um, Bernard Casey, uh, again, uh, you talked about uh, cooking, cleaning, and um, caring. Uh, may I add a fourth C, construction. Many people come over the border, uh, but this time they're men and some... Uh, sorry, I'm misreading this. Many people come over the border and this time they're, they're men. How relatively marginalized are they? Do I think they face, very. Do they face similar problems? Well, I think they're very marginalized, but let me say they come with a different visa. So I don't know the specifics. To be honest, it's something that I would like to, uh, to look into more because I, I do suspect that they face, if not the same problems, problems of similar severity. Um, but they are men. And, and that gives them an advantage, at least in terms of uh, sexual exploitation. Not physical exploitation, though. Uh, a few months ago, we had a, a case of two men who were held essentially prisoners in a farm somewhere in Limassol and forced to do, basically treated as slaves. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for just two more questions. Uh, I think we've um, um, imposed on you quite a lot. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Uh, today. Uh, so there's a question uh, from uh, Diseri Berinci uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Many of the issues you've talked about clearly concern access to social and economic rights, which are not dealt with by the European Court of Human Rights. And this makes domestic legislation even more important. Are there adequate legal mechanisms currently existing in Cyprus for enforcing social and economic rights? Does the fact that the frozen conflict, conflict uh, bears certain implications over Cypriot constitutional law? Uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, the question is just flipped off my screen. Let me find that uh, again, it's the, uh, when the questions uh, come in rapidly. I'm sorry, uh, Nasia, let me repeat. So uh, the, f the first point is a comment that social and, economic, social and economic rights are not covered by the European Court of Human Rights and that makes domestic legislation even more important. In that context, are there, in other respects, adequate legal mechanisms uh, currently existing in Cyprus to enforce social and economic rights. And you refer to the uh, frozen conflict uh, that has certain implications over Cypriot constitutional law. And does that visibly hinder the possibility of strengthening human rights legislation in the Republic of Cyprus? So I guess uh, your answer to the second question is yes. And that's very much what you've been arguing, that the frozen conflict um, uh, limits human rights protection in these kinds of cases. Uh, but I wonder if you could comment about uh, the rights of redress, the channels for redress in terms of social and economic, economic rights in, in Cyprus. Are there, are there mechanisms which are otherwise adequate? 
No. I, I mean, I'm afraid the answer is a simple one. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any legal mechanisms to enforce socioeconomic rights um, in Cyprus. So that, that, that was the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question, I think uh, the question related specifically to the constitutional protection of, of human rights. And, and if, if I understood correctly, it had to do with the doctrine of necessity. This idea that we are essentially amending the constitution without following the correct procedures for amendment of the constitution because of the frozen conflict. If you look at the frozen conflict in this very narrow legal sense, in, term, in the sense of amending the constitution, I don't think the doctrine of necessity has had a real impact on socioeconomic rights. If you look at the frozen conflict in its broader sense, which is what I have been doing today, discussing the social implications of the frozen conflict, I, I would argue that it undoubtedly has an impact. Okay. The final question is um, a search for uh, something positive. Uh, Eliki Paris uh, suggests that prior to closing, it might be good if you were to mention the foreign direct foreign domestic workers that are, are um, taken well care of. Oh yes, I mean, I mean, don't don't. What I have been describing are tendencies. Yes, I mean, there are of course women who are treated in the correct manner by their employers. There are also women who we interviewed and, and, and who say that they, they view the families they work for as their families. Um, however, that is because they have been lucky enough to find themselves in a family that is loving and uh, correct in terms of its legal obligations. The argument that I have been making is not that Cypriots are, are monsters. The argument that I have been making is that the Cypriot um, legal framework allows those that are monsters to abuse their employees. Yes, okay. Well, thank you. Um, we must now draw to a close. I know that there are very good comments and questions coming from uh, other people. Uh, there's one uh, from Dolor Dolores Savides. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't get to that uh, because of the time. Um, Nasia has been reporting on her research project, um, which is um, funded um, by the Hellenic Observatory, but the, the scheme is actually funded by the A.G. Leventis Foundation. And let me... Uh, record our thanks once again to the Leventis Foundation for supporting such uh, research, original research, challenging research, research that makes us uh, stop and reflect on uh, some uh, sensitive uh, matters. Before I thank uh, Nasia, let me just mention that the Hellenic Observatory will continue with its uh, public events. Our next research seminar the next in this series will be on Tuesday, the 16th of uh, March. You can see, now see it on your screen. Uh, it is with Orthon Anasetsakis, uh, director of CSOX at uh, Oxford, and Fortini Kalanzi, uh, also at uh, St. Anthony's in Oxford. And the title is Crisis and Change, the Right of Greek Citizens to Vote Abroad. Uh, that's our next research seminar. Our next public event is uh, with Evclides Zakonotis, the uh, speaker of the Syriza Parliamentary Group, coordinator of Syriza's economic policy, and of course, former Minister of Finance uh, in Greece. And I'll be in conversation with Evclides Zakonotis with the, with the theme of the left in power, reflections on Syriza's promise and achievements. And that's on the uh, 22nd of March, UK time, 4 p.m., uh, same uh, as today, uh, 22nd of, of March. Uh, do join us for that. But as we close, uh, let me thank all of you uh, for uh, watching, 
for your many questions, uh, which have been very uh, stimulating. But above all, let me uh, thank Nasia for uh, joining us and for reporting uh, on her original uh, research. And yes, uh, Nasia, for answering so many questions. I hope you have uh, enjoyed it, uh, but thank you for joining us. I did enjoy it. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're very well welcome. And we look forward to seeing everyone again at one of our upcoming events. But for now, wherever you're joining us from, thank you very much indeed. Good night. Good night.